congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord has gathered us again this afternoon to worship his name. We welcome any visitors joining us and also those joining us by live stream. May the Lord be praised through our worship. Before we begin the worship service, we have the following announcements. Pastor Central will meet the Lord willing on Friday, the 21st of October, 2022, in the Free Reform Church of Armadale. And Consistory will meet tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. And the call to worship this afternoon comes from Psalm 50. Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. We are able, let us rise to worship the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Receive now the greeting of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and a ruler over the kings of the earth. Amen. Congregation, let us praise God by singing together from Psalm 92, stanzas 1 and 2, and thereafter remain standing for the singing of the Creed. Together with the Church of all times and places, let us now make profession of our Catholic, undoubted Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed by singing together hymn one.
let us draw near to the Lord in prayer and ask for a blessing over the proclamation of the gospel. Our Father in heaven, we rejoice at the privilege of being able to come to you and know you as Father. We have gathered together as your children this afternoon. We thank you that you have made your covenant with us, that you have claimed us to be your own. Father, you are intimately acquainted with the needs of each one of us. In your wisdom, you have provided that we can gather together twice every Sunday to listen to the preaching of your word. And Father, you know in which way each one of us needs to be fed. We pray that you will graciously do that this afternoon. Nourish and strengthen the faith of each one of us through your word and spirit. We rejoice that you have made your covenant with our children too. That they too are summoned to listen to your word. Be with them. That in accordance with their age and understanding they too may grow in their knowledge of you. Bless our worship. That it may indeed be pleasing to you. Bless the gifts we bring for the work in Cairns. That the gospel may continue to go forth there with power. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, we pray these things. Amen. Our scripture reading this afternoon comes from the New Testament. First of all from Romans chapter 8. Verse 9 through 17, and then we turn to the first letter of the Apostle Peter, chapter 1, the verses 1 through 9. So Romans chapter 8, the verses 9 through 17. <clears throat> Romans 8, verse 9. Hear the word of our God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And we turn now to the first letter Peter chapter 1, the verses 1 through 9. First Peter chapter 1, we read the verses 1 through 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. This you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, 
though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So far, the reading of God's word. And as we prepare to listen to God's word proclaimed, let us sing. We have the words of 1 Peter 1 set to music in hymn 36. Hymn 36, verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. text for this afternoon's proclamation of the gospel is God's revelation about the resurrection of Christ and the benefits for us as the church has summarized those and we together confess them in Lord's Day 17 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Lord's Day 17 where it is asked and answered, how does Christ's resurrection benefit us? First, by his resurrection he has overcome death so that he could make us share in the righteousness which he had obtained for us by his death. Second, by his power we too are raised up to a new life. Third, Christ's resurrection is to us a sure pledge of our glorious resurrection. After the sermon we sing about the Resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ with the words of hymn 31, stanzas 1 and 2. Hymn 31, stanzas 1 and 2, after the sermon. <coughs> Beloved congregation of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, without Jesus Christ, this life is really a system of death. We can think of physical death. We know that as life goes on, we draw nearer to the day of our own death. We experience that in the death of loved ones. I think back to the beginning of the, the Bible, Genesis chapter 5, where we read that Adam, after so many years, had a son, and he lived so many years after the birth of that son, had other sons and daughters, and then he died. And we read the same about Seth, and then he died. And we read the same about Seth's son Enosh, and then he died. One after another, people die. Life it's really a system of death because of the fall into sin. God had said death will come and it has come and the world is full of death. It's not just physical death. 
There's also spiritual death. There's also that side of that death that came through the fall into sin. That man became spiritually dead. And that means when you're spiritually dead, you cannot do anything but sin. You cannot turn back to God and, and serve Him and love Him of yourself. And being spiritually dead, unable to do any good, means you live through this life spiritually dead and then you end up physically dying and it seals your everlasting punishment. What we heard about this morning, the second death. Everlasting punishment in hell. Without Jesus Christ, this life is really a system of death. And it's against this dark backdrop that we see the glory of the gospel of the risen Christ. Who rose from the dead to die no more. He's the prince of and the Lord of life. So we pay attention this afternoon to the, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, congregation, the resurrection is really a work of the triune God. And that's what we're going to pay attention to this afternoon. The God who has made his covenant with you when you were baptized. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they spoke to you. This God. The resurrection is His work. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And so we pay attention to the message of the resurrection of Christ under this theme. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. A mighty work of the triune God for your salvation. The resurrection is a mighty work of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and also of the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a mighty work of the triune God for your salvation. The resurrection is first of all a mighty work of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a, it's a turning point in his work for us sinners. The Lord Jesus Christ had humbled himself all the way down to the grave. Yes, he was on one line with that list of Genesis 5 that I mentioned in the introduction. And he died and he died. That's a world under sin and a curse. And the Lord Jesus Christ became part of that world and he died. That's how far he humbled himself. The resurrection represents a turning point. The resurrection is the beginning of his exaltation. He comes out of the grave. Far greater way, in a far greater way than, than Lazarus. Lazarus would have eventually returned to the grave. The Lord Jesus raised him from the dead. But the Lord Jesus, when, when he rose... He would never return to the grave. His humiliation was finished forever. And then congregation, at this point we pay attention to the fact that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. And the scriptures talk in a number of ways about the resurrection. Sometimes the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about it as I will rise. I will lay down my life and I will take it up again. I will do it. Speaking about himself. At other times, the scriptures talk about the Lord Jesus being raised. So someone else does the raising. I think of Acts chapter 2, verse 32. This Jesus, God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. So there, God raised up Jesus. And brothers and sisters, we need to understand the significance that God raised up Jesus for our salvation, for our comfort. Why was Jesus in the grave? Why did he need to suffer 
and die. And we can use that passage, that beautiful passage, expositing, explaining the death of Christ, Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 verse 10, there we read, Yet, talking about the suffering that Christ would go through, and this is what it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, the suffering servant, Jesus Christ. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, it pleased the Lord, God, to make his son suffer. And why? Again, that chapter, earlier on in the chapter, verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. So the Lord Jesus put to death God, caused his son to be put to death. Why? Because our sins were on him. My sins. Your sins. Peter's sins and Adam's sins and Abraham's sins. Because of the curse of God on sin. That's why Jesus had to die. That's why it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Because he was carrying our sins. And then you see the riches in the fact that God raised him from the dead. The one who raised him from the dead was the one who brought him there as punishment. And the implication is that the sins have been paid for. Because the one who put him in the prison of death is the one who then also lets him out, who brings him out, who causes him to rise. Comfort, yes, comfort my people. Speak peace to Jerusalem, for her iniquity is pardoned. That's what we see happening when the Lord is brought out of the grave, when God raises him up from the dead. Would the just and holy God, whose anger and punishment on sin is so fierce, would he have caused his son who was carrying the burden of sin on him, would he have taken him out of the grave if there was still any outstanding debt to be paid? No, God is just. That's why you see the, the riches, the comforting riches in his resurrection. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 4, at the end of the chapter, he says about Jesus Christ, he was delivered up for our offences and he was raised for our justification. That means he was raised so that we might know, we sinners who had all our sins put on him, we might know that our sins have been completely paid for. Because God, who put him there in the first place, raised him from the dead. And so rejoice that he was raised by God. That's the payment for your sins, fully done. Without the resurrection of Christ, Life is nothing but a system of death. That's only fair. God had said, the day you eat, you will die. There's punishment. There's consequences. And people are spiritually dead. Nobody can clean up the mess that we made through the fall into sin. But he had our sins on him. God punished him. God raised him from the dead. Then look at the riches that come to us from God in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I refer you to the reading, the second reading, 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Can you, can you hear the excitement in Peter's writing as it were? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
who has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection. We've been begotten again as the people of God. The Father has restored us to be children of God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What blessings come to us from the God who raised His Son from the dead. We've been begotten again to a living hope, to an inheritance. What a beautiful thing. Because of Jesus Christ's resurrection, you've been begotten again to a living hope, to an inheritance. That's what you're going to receive as children of God, as heirs, an inheritance. That inheritance, that place on the new earth, everlasting life with God, fully restored, being able to serve God in wonderful harmony, no more sin forevermore. With no more brokenness of this life. What, what comfort. We go through this life. A world of, of pain and suffering. And we experience that in different ways. What comfort to look forward to an inheritance. Where there will be no more of that. Where we will be able to live life to the fullest. What comfort in a life. In a world in which we continue to be weighed down by sin. Looking forward to that inheritance. Where there will be no more sin. But there'll be no more guilty consciences able to serve God forever. What a future. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who caused us to be begotten again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to that inheritance. Yes, you could say the resurrection is like a cup of blessings. And there's more to it. There's also the blessing of spiritual life. We've been just talking about the glorious things that are coming through the resurrection of Christ. We've got that inheritance. Last day, what's coming. But there's also huge, rich blessings for today through the resurrection. The Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesians. And I'm going to refer you to chapter 2. And in that chapter, he's speaking about those who were dead, that we were dead in trespasses and sin. In other words, when you're dead in trespasses and sin, that's that spiritual death that we talked about at the beginning of the sermon, when you can do nothing but sin. You're a slave of sin. And Paul writes there in chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, But God, who is rich in mercy... God who takes pity on wretched, undeserving sinners who made a mess. They can't do anything to get themselves out of it. God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. That being made alive together with Christ, that's our spiritual renewal. That we are no more dead in sin. We've been given new life, something we receive by by faith in Christ. We're made alive unto holy living. Yet Christ rose from the dead. And we share in that, in that we are given new spiritual life today. That we delight in doing good. That we want to serve God and show love to our neighbour and live according to the commandments of God. Because Jesus Christ has been raised, brothers and sisters. You have in Him all you need to live a life of holiness and obedience in love for God and love for your neighbour. In Christ. Let me ask you, why is world conformity so easy? Why does it come so easily that we fit in with the ways of the world, with the attitudes of the world, with the tastes of the world, enjoying what they enjoy, dressing as they dress, living for what they live for? Why why does that come so easy? Because it comes naturally. By nature we are inclined to all manner of evil. And world conformity, you don't need to be trained for that. It's easy. 
to be shaped like that. But why? Why should we not be conformed to this world in which we live? Why should we live different lives, holy lives, lives that are a reflection of God's commandments? Why? Because God raised up Christ. And he raises us with him. You've been given new spiritual life so that you can live. And yes, we remain in these bodies and we continue to feel the pull of sin. And so we're going to feel the pull of temptation and it's going to come in this way and that. Temptations to do the wrong thing, to have evil thoughts, to speak evil words. To indulge evil desires. And it's going to be a fight. But the calling of the gospel is. Fight sin and temptation. Believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It will remain a struggle throughout life. Yes a young person struggles. Is going to be different from an older person struggles. But the struggle remains. Because we have that broken human nature. Dead in sin. But we've been given new life. Heed the call to arms to fight that fight. Because Christ was raised from the dead, you should expect to see holy living. And that's why it makes sense for parents to train their children in the ways of the Lord. It's not going to come naturally to those children. World conformity is what's going to come easy to the children. The parents are going to teach their children to walk in the Lord's ways, to call them to that. Why? Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead and in him there is new power. That's why the office bearers, the elders in their work in the flock, when they come encouraging, maybe sometimes also admonishing and calling us to, to conform more to the, the ways of the Lord, they can, they can do that. They can ask that. Why? Because we're a congregation of believers who believe in the resurrection. That's where the strength is to walk in the Lord's ways. The battle against sin is not hopeless. Why not? Because Christ rose from the dead. That's the power that he then gives to work in us, to give us that strength. Congregation also savor, as it were, the, the plural in the answer. What are the how does Christ's resurrection benefit us? And you know, sometimes the catechism puts it in the singular. What's your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong to my Saviour, so the singular. But there's sometimes the catechism also uses the plural, and in this case it uses the plural. And both are applicable, but it's also good to think about it in terms of the plural. How does Christ's resurrection benefit us? By his resurrection, he has overcome death so that he could make us share. By his power, we are raised up to a new life. It's a sure pledge of our glorious resurrection. It puts it in the plural. We, the believing church, the community of those who say together, we believe in Christ's resurrection. We are joined in our confession. This is a communal confession. We are a congregation. And we need to think about this. We are a community of life. Because of our faith in Christ's resurrection, we are a community of life in the midst of a world of death that remains under the power of death. See how much you have in common with one another. You believe in Jesus Christ and He raises you up together to a new life. You're a community of new life together. You are different from the world in which you live. Therefore treasure one another as, as fellow believers, as fellow people who share that life together. Why you shouldn't go seeking close relationships and romantic relationships with those who remain in darkness because you are the people who have been given new life. That's why we need to also see that and build those bonds together as fellow believers. We believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, congregation, the blessings, the blessings that come from our confession in the resurrection of Christ. Justification from our sins. 
that spiritual renewal, the strength to fight against sin and temptation, becoming together a community, a believing community who together enjoys life. Which brings us in the second place to the resurrection is a mighty work of our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. As we said earlier, sometimes it says Jesus was raised. In other cases, Jesus spoke about himself doing it. Another text where that happens is John chapter 2, verse 19. John chapter 2, verse 19, where the Lord Jesus was talking about rebuilding the temple. Break down this temple and I'll rebuild it. And he's talking about the temple of his body. Jesus said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He would raise it up. He would come forth to new life. He would do it. And in Romans chapter 1, the apostle said that's how he showed himself to be the son of God. Romans 1 verse 4 declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. By Him rising in His own power, He showed Himself to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Compare that to Lazarus' resurrection. Lazarus, he came forth from the tomb when he was called. The Lord Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. The Lord Jesus himself, he rises from the dead. As he said in John chapter 10, John 10 verse 18. I, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. I have power to take my life again, he says. And why? And if you think about what is John 10 talking about? About the Lord Jesus Christ being the, the great shepherd of his sheep, who really cares. And as the shepherd of his sheep, he says, I'm the good shepherd, the hireling. He flees when he sees danger coming. But the good shepherd, he protects his sheep and he lays down his life. For his sheep. He's the great shepherd who really cares. Who lays down his life and then also takes it up again. Because of his care and love for his sheep. And he needed to come back to life. To grant you, his sheep, benefits. To deliver you from danger. He speaks about the dangers that are coming against the sheep. And what's the biggest danger that we face? The curse because of our sin, which is ultimately death, the destruction that would come. And the shepherd, he placed himself in danger. He took the brunt of what was coming your way in your place to protect you and save you. He laid down his life and then also took it up again so that he could make you share in what he had obtained by laying down his life. As this Lord's Day said, by his resurrection he has overcome death so that he could make us share in the righteousness which he had obtained for us by his death. And there's more to it. He laid down his life and he took it up again to make you share in benefits. We also can read about another one in Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews 7 verse 25 where the Hebrew Christians are given the following encouragement. Hebrews 7 verse 25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Why? Since he always lives to make intercession for them. You have a living mediator in heaven and he always lives. Why? To be able to make intercession for you, his sheep. To make you share in the forgiveness that he has obtained. You come to God in prayer. You humble yourself before the Lord because of your sins and you pray for forgiveness. And in heaven you have a living mediator. No more dead, but a living mediator 
who pleads with the Father on your behalf so that you can know that your sins are forgiven. He makes you share in the forgiveness that He obtained, pleading with the Father on your behalf. See, congregation, the victory. We talked about it this morning too. The victory of Genesis chapter 3. Yes, the seed of the woman did crush the head of the serpent. He was struck. First of all, his heel was struck when the devils lashed out at him. And the devil brought him to the cross to death. But then he arose victorious. The seed of the woman crushed the head of the serpent. Defeated him. He's victorious over sin. And the curse and death. See how much the Son of God loves you. He laid down his life for you and took it up again for your salvation. Therefore live, congregation, as sheep of the risen Saviour. Live joyful lives because of the forgiveness of sins. Your shepherd loved you so much. He laid down his life. He took his life up again to make you share in the riches he had obtained. When you're brought low by your sins, when you see in light of God's law how far short you fall, when you cry out in your prayers for forgiveness, then trust in your living Saviour came back to life to make you share, who continues to live to make you share in what he obtained for you. And when you struggle against sin's power and you can feel the pull and you're being dragged down and it's getting hard to keep fighting those, those temptations that are coming your way, then look to Jesus Christ who lives at the Father's right hand. He's the intercessor. Not only to plead with the Father for forgiveness for you, but also to give you grace to help in time of need, the letter to the Hebrews says. He'll give you the strength to stand firm in the fight against sin. Do you live like this, brothers and sisters? Do you live by faith in the risen Saviour? that come out? Say in our times of entertainment and recreation, our Friday nights, our Saturdays. The things we do, do they fit with what we confess on Sunday afternoon? I believe in Jesus Christ who rose from the dead. Is there that fighting against temptation in our lives? Hating sin. Fleeing to the Saviour for forgiveness and the strength to, to do God's will. Are we living also joyful lives? Is your life characterised by joy? Because you have a living Saviour. You believe in a Saviour who rose from the dead and therefore your sins have been paid for. Your future is glorious. The joy of our lives match our confession about the resurrection of our Saviour. Finally, we pay attention to the fact that the resurrection is also a mighty work of the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> when God performs deeds, it is the triune God who does it. <coughs> Sometimes the one or the other person of the Trinity will have the, the main focus. We talk about God the Father and our creation and so on. But it's really the, the three persons working together. And so when we talk about the resurrection, that too is a mighty work of the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit too is involved in the resurrection. Then I draw your attention to our Bible reading from Romans chapter 8, verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 
So it does speak there about the spirit of him, that's God, who raised Jesus from the dead. But the focus is on the spirit. He will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And this spirit will also raise you. The spirit who was involved in the resurrection of Jesus Christ will also raise you. Then congregation take comfort from the application that the Apostle Paul is giving here. If that spirit dwells in you, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead will raise, give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. If the spirit is dwelling in you, that spirit will raise your bodies on the last day. That spirit who is at work in your life today, that spirit who makes you understand the word of God, that spirit who changes you, that spirit who pricks your conscience when you have sinned, that spirit who gives you joy and forgiveness at work in you, that spirit who's at work in your life, he's going to do an amazing thing on the last day. He will transform you in the twinkling of an eye. What a thing to think about. As we experience also the frailty of the body in this life. That that spirit whose presence in our life we rejoice in as he works in us. He will then raise us up at the last day. Give us new life. That new life on the new earth. That spirit who will be involved with raising you is the one who dwells in you. Now we can flip it around and look at it the other way around. His presence should be visible in your life today then. How is the presence of the Spirit seen? Through, through faithful and obedient living. We walk with the Lord as we love Him and serve Him and strive to keep His commandments and live by faith. His presence should be visible in our lives today. Because there is a warning. Not all are raised up to everlasting life. The Bible makes clear. Not everybody gets everlasting life. Not even all members of the covenant community get everlasting life. Some will perish. In everlasting punishment. The Lord Jesus even said it's going to be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah than for covenant people who have refused to believe in Jesus Christ. They're not going to be raised on the last day because they refuse to walk in the ways of the Lord. Already in this life, they're refusing to walk with God. Therefore, congregation, the calling is live and walk in the Spirit. He raised Christ. The Spirit did. And He made promises to each of you too. And how do I know that? Because you were baptized. And you were baptized into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And what does it mean to be baptized into the name of the Spirit? When we are baptized into the name of the Spirit, God the Spirit promises to dwell in us, to make us living members of Christ, imparting to us what we have in Christ, namely the forgiveness of our sins and the daily renewal of our lives until we should stand without blemish among the assembly of God's elect in life eternal. The Spirit has promised to work in you. Trust that promise. Look to that promise to give you what you need to walk in the ways of God. Live in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. The Spirit who dwells in you today is the one who will also raise you on the last day. Yes, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a mighty work of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Believe in your covenant God who loves you. The Father who caused his son to be raised 
so that you might know that your sins are paid for. There's no outstanding debt. The one who put him there brought him out again. <clears throat> Believe in your covenant God, also the Son who loves you, who stood between you and the danger that was coming your way, everlasting destruction, who laid down his life and came back to life so that he could give you what he had obtained. Believe in the Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead, who also lives in you, who's working faith in you, who's changing you, and he will on the last day also raise you. Believe in your covenant God who loves you. Rejoice at what he did at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In your risen Saviour, in this world of death, you have life. Not just for a while, but forever. A life that also is there today in that spiritual renewal. In your risen Saviour, you have life and you belong to a community. A communion of saints who will live forever. Amen. Let us come before the Lord in prayer and thanksgiving. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We praise you, our triune God, for your mighty work in the resurrection. We praise you, Father, for your work in raising our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. We rejoice in the assurance of forgiveness that we thereby receive. Father, when we look back on this past week, we are burdened with many sins and shortcomings. But to know that also all of those sins have been paid for by Christ completely. He came back to life. We bless and praise you for causing us to be begotten again by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We thank you for the life you give us in the midst of a world of death. 
We thank you that we can look forward to that inheritance incorruptible on the new earth, serving you in perfected bodies forever. Grant that we may live as those who have been given new life. That we may put away sin from our lives, from our midst. That we may fight against sin. And grant that as church we may be a living community that we treasure one another as fellow believers, as fellow heirs of life, as fellow living believers. That we may rejoice in what we have. We thank you that we can together look forward to the great day of the resurrection. And we will all receive glorified bodies. And we look forward to that day. Bless us in this week that lies before us. In all our activities that we may live as your children. That we may live as those who live and walk in the spirit. Bless the plans we make. Bless the discussions we have, the communications we get involved in. That we may do your will, submit to your word, bring glory to your name. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And we pray that you will continue to gather your church throughout this world. That also in this coming week, your people throughout this world may be looked after. And they may continue to seek the coming of your kingdom. We pray too for our sister churches in South Africa. Bless them. Also as they live in a ungodly culture. That they may be faithful. Bless them as they also are busy with mission work. For the people of their own nation. Bringing the gospel. Thank you for the growth over the years. Also in the mission congregations that eventually became established. We rejoice in your goodness and pray that you'll continue to bless all our brothers and sisters in South Africa. Bless the theological training that they are involved with, the students that are there, that they may be well served through preachers and teachers of the gospel. Your word may continue to go forth. That country throughout Africa, throughout the world. Father, we pray that you will so continue to make your kingdom come. We pray that the day may come soon. The full number of the elect completely gathered in. And our Lord Jesus Christ returns on the clouds of heaven. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. You now have opportunity to bring your thank offerings for the work in Cairns. And after we have brought our offerings, let us rise and praise the Lord together by singing Psalm 16, stanzas 4 and 5.
Let us lift up our hearts to the Lord and receive his blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.